Hello, everyone. I'm Sam Ekman of Gold Derby, and with me is Matt Shekman, the director of WandaVision from Disney+. Plus. And this series, Matt, just incorporates so many elements. And, you know, most television series, as you know, you have a, a long career in, in TV, would have, you know, many directors tackling things that you took on this entire project for every episode. Uh, what is it like being able to sort of be the singular person and carry your one vision throughout all episodes of a TV show? WandaVision was such an unusual show in that we went to so many different sitcom realities, but we also were telling this much larger story about Wanda dealing with loss and grief. I think having one director helped to hold that all together from, a, from an acting standpoint, from a thematic standpoint, but also stylistically. Um, there was just so much to prep um, and design in advance, and we wanted to approach all of these different sitcom eras with love and authenticity. The show was really meant to be this big love letter to the history of TV that so much prep had to be done. You just couldn't have done it with one person coming in to do an episode. We kind of needed to break the back of the whole thing from the beginning. Um, and Marvel was great. They, they had been doing films up to that point. So they understood how to approach movies, you know, and they wanted to do the same with TV. And that allowed for, I think, it to have a more cohesive vision from beginning to end. Yeah. And as you said, it's uh, sort of a love letter to classic television. Each episode is a different uh, decade of sitcoms. Um, in that sense, did you feel like you almost had to sort of change up your tactic or directing style for, for each installment? How did you tackle everything changing so much each episode? Yeah, definitely. It felt like we were doing pilot after pilot after pilot, just in a different era. Um, we wanted to make sure that we were approaching it with authenticity. We never wanted it, things to move into parody, even though we were drawing from so many different reference points. Ultimately, we were creating WandaVision. This was Wanda Maximoff's sitcom drawn from the DNA of so many different shows that she loved watching growing up with her parents in Eastern Europe. And so we, um, we researched as heavily as we could. The department heads and I worked very closely um, and we did, we watched old prints and we, we talked to people who made the shows, we read books about how they made them and we watched countless episodes of course and broke them down. And the same was true with the actors. We had this thing called sitcom boot camp when we started where we got together and it was a rehearsal period but it was also a chance to watch old episodes and talk about how acting styles have changed and how comedy is different from era to era. And then when you add all those wonderful costumes and incredible sets, it really just comes to life. Um, I should also mention we had a great dialect coach and, and movement coach who helped us adjust how we would speak in each era and how we would move. And so it was it was a lot of hard work to be as specific as we possibly could. And we changed our approach, you know, depending on the era. So the first episode was was drawn on I Love Lucy and Dick Van Dyke. And so we did it in front of a live studio audience, which was really fun. And it was the first thing we did on the show. And it and the actors had to really kind of jump off a cliff and they're wonderful and ready to take any kind of risk. And so that was a really fun way to start. And then once you get into our second episode, which is more I Dream of Genie or Bewitched, it was single camera. So it was a four wall set and it was done in a very different style. And that changed every episode sort of approached the filming of it, the shooting of it, the style of it had to match you know, the era you know, that we were that we were trying to recreate. Was there one particular uh, style or decade that really uh, stood out as your favorite to, to do? Such a hard question to answer because WandaVision was the director's dream. You know, no day was like another day. You'd be doing a witch's coven in old Salem one day and you'd be doing a live show in front of a studio audience from the 50s the next day. Um, but I have to say probably the 70s just because the set design by Mark Worthington was extraordinary. We all just loved that set and wanted to be in it. The costume design by Myas Rubio was incredible. Um, the palette um, and also just the, the writing of that particular episode was great. It's hugely funny. There's so much going on. It's very zany with storks and, and different coats and everything's kind of going crazy. And of course the birth of the twins um, the, the 70s is such a hard decade, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. so colorful and beautiful, but it skews towards parody really quickly. It's a self-parodying sort of era. Um, so how do you do bell bottoms and sideburns and crazy hair without feeling like you're making fun of it? So it was fun to try to ride that line. Um, you know, for instance, Paul Bettany and his amazing hair, rather than looking at the Brady's, we looked at Robert Redford, who was the height of cool in the 70s. And we looked at Three Days of the Condor and tried to, to come up with the feathered hair and the sideburns that were the, the classiest of that era. I would think also that the 
tone of the series is, is really challenging to get right because in addition to the sitcom world, you also dive into the, the real world with you know Darcy and everyone doing that investigation out there. And those two are constantly uh, coming up against one another and the sitcom world starts to fall away. How did you sort of balance all of these disparate elements coming together? Tone is really the sort of great mystery of the show. Um, and it's a great mystery of everything that I'd like to do. I, I think it's the most fun thing as a director is to try to figure out how you can make those big turns um, and pull them off. And I think part of it is having the most amazing cast in the world and incredible writing. Um, but a lot of it is play, you know, really the rule of improv, this idea of yes and, where you'd never say no to anything, you just try lots of things is really a secret sauce, I think. Can this be bolder, funnier, broader, sillier? maybe now we should think about making this more grounded. What are the stakes here? What's happening emotionally here? And you just keep reminding yourself and find those sort of different layers and work as a group to build it together. Um, and then when you get in the editing room, you have all of these different options and you can kind of take a step back and look at the whole and say, oh yeah, that's we could be sillier here. And oh, we need to be reminding ourselves about the stakes here. Um, and also what's fun about the show is that we were constantly revealing little bits of the larger truths of the show. You know, this sort of the, the trauma that Wanda has experienced or grief or loss percolates uh, up to the top in these scenes, you know, at the dinner table with her, her uh, you know, Vision's boss and his wife, um, you know, at the beekeeper emerging at the end. And so we would veer out of these really focused, stylized sitcom worlds into more of like the Twilight Zone, you know, a, a similar period approach, but where things became more subjective and creepy and weird. And so that was a lot of fun to, to do as well, but it required a lot of planning and then also a lot of fun on the day. And, you know, most, well, not most, many directors uh, end up having a genre or a style that they feel comfortable with or are known for, but you really have worked across the board, I think, in TV from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, Game of Thrones, Mad Men, The Great, like all these different types of uh, stories. So do, like, considering how ambitious and, and complex WandaVision is, did you feel like, yeah, I'm coming into this and I have all I, I've done all these things. I have all the tools I need. I come from theater. You know, I'm a theater director. I run a, a playhouse in Los Angeles called the, the Geffen Playhouse. And uh, in theater, directors are kind of expected to do all of that. You know, summer stock theater is the new musical, Shakespeare, the play, uh, you know, the old coward play, whatever. And, and that's fun is that you're able to try on these different tones and styles. But yeah, uh, in film and TV, you often are supposed to pick a lane. Um, and I guess I never quite got that memo because I've been sort of careening around from one lane to the next for an entire career. But it's been really fun. I love that. I love being able to do It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia and then also go and do Mad Men or Fargo our succession. And I love what's happening also in streaming and cable. There's been such a move over the last you know, decade into these shows that can be everything because that's what life is. Life is not just one tone or genre, right? I love succession for that uh, reason. You know, it's written by some of the funniest comedy writers you'll ever meet. And yet it's also incredibly dark family drama. And the fact that both of those things, comedy and drama coexist makes for really surprising television. I loved working on The Great, which was the same, you know, when I did the pilot for The Great, that was based on a, a play, a originally, which maybe explains its DNA. But again, it turns from horror film into comedy, into drama um, uh, very, very quickly. And so coming to Wanda was just another example of, of how bold I think we can be and should be in television these days um, and how exciting it is to do things that, that's much more like life, you know? Yeah. And this series has a lot of, I think one of the aspects that kept people so uh, engaged constantly was all of these mysteries and things to kind of follow along with and unravel. And when you have, as a director, when you're thinking about like a big reveal moment, like when uh, Agnes is revealed to be Agatha Harkness, how do you think about sort of building that moment and charting it so that the reveal has payoff for the audience? I think it's really important if you have a big reveal that you need to leave a trail of breadcrumbs. You wanna make sure that that reveal is surprising, but also inevitable, right? You don't wanna feel like it's coming out of left field. Um, and so for Agatha Harkness, for instance, uh, there's little clever um, hints in dialogue along the way. Uh, certainly the way we dressed her, she's wearing purple, she's got a cameo, which is all from the Agatha character in the comic book history. Um, 
So we were definitely letting folks know there's more to Agatha, more to Agnes than might appear. Um, and so by the time we then do our big reveal in the basement, yeah, there'll be some people who say, like, oh yeah, I saw that coming. But I'd rather that there are a few people who say that coming than everyone go, well, that doesn't make any sense. I don't know, you know, where did that come from? You, it needs to feel inevitable. Um, and then also, if you do see it coming a little bit, you have uh, the Lopez's write an amazing song. Um, and then hopefully it's really enjoyable, even if you saw it coming. Yeah, the song was uh, pretty great. Um, and, you know, there's lots of big moments like that. There's big spectacle, there's fights, there's heightened comedy, but there's a, many really great uh, quiet moments like um, Paul Bettany's But What Is Grief moment to, to Wanda. How do you, in a series that can be so big, how do you decide moments to sort of pull back and simplify? I mean, that was one of the great things about being able to do the whole thing is that we were we were looking at the, the whole field the whole time. So you really could get a sense of it as one six hour miniseries as opposed to episode to episode. Um, we were playing with the episode structure because it's this love letter to television and we knew we'd be releasing weekly. We wanted to intentionally play with cliffhangers and the way that television has used itself as a medium for so many years um, to dole out information. But ultimately we, we were able to to look at that full six hours, um, that emotional landscape that you know we knew where we had to get to, and um, and the ending of the show was was pretty much locked in from the beginning. So much changed, you know, set pieces changed, ideas changed, um, dialogue would change, moments would change, of course, but the end of the show was locked in from the beginning, which is Wanda needing to say goodbye to Vision, getting from you know uh, through the stages of grief to acceptance to the idea that she had to say goodbye to Vision. So that moment was always there and we could build back from it. And I think it's always easiest to do a maze backwards, you know? And so if you know where you're going, it's easy to build it, you know, uh, because you know where you want to go. Yeah. Well, one thing that did change uh, was your release date because you weren't supposed to be the first uh, Marvel show on Disney Plus, but then things switched around. Is that, what was it like? Did you feel pressure, you know, suddenly staring down the fact that you have to be the first one out of the gate and they haven't done this on TV before or streaming before? I mean, we were just kind of, you know, running our own race, you know, we were just kind of trying to get the work done to the best uh, of our abilities and the fact that our release date got moved up, you know, uh, or moved ahead of Falcon didn't really change it for us. We were still kind of trying to get it done, you know, as soon as possible based on the schedule and we were excited to get back to to work uh, as soon as possible once it was safe, you know, the, the lockdown, uh, we'd shot about two thirds of the show before the lockdown and then we had to sort of move into post production waiting for the safety guidelines to to be put into effect so that we could go back to work and finish shooting and, and then finally get the show out there but you know it was um it was uh, probably a great thing in the end to have a show like wandavision that was a love letter to television come out first you know that this was the first of the marvel studios disney plus shows made sense because it really is honoring all of the tv that has come before tv that i loved growing up tv that i was a part of because i was a sitcom actor you know as a kid um being on those sound stages um it really is meant to be this love letter so i think the fact that it, it came out first in the end made sense and then here was the show about about grief and loss and love and how do we you know offer comfort in this time um uh, of, a, of a pandemic you know and so we could never have imagined coming out during this time but maybe it was good that we did you know because I, I heard so many wonderful stories about families coming together you know around the tv around the hearth in the home and watching t this, this show wandavision the way that you know so many have over the years around television having it bring comfort um stories about grandparents telling grandkids about what the Dick Van Dyke show was, and then the grandkids telling grandparents, uh, you know, who the Avengers are, you know, and, and that's really special. So I'm, I'm glad that in the end, it, it, it ended up working out the way it did. And I was glad they kept a, a weekly release schedule because it allowed us all to, you know, anticipate and theorize, which I'm sure you've had, you know, that's a great thing about television like this is it engages the audience that way week to week. I know you've had some probably experience with that on shows like Game of Thrones, but WandaVision really uh, had the internet going nuts every week. Were you following along with all of that online? Oh, absolutely. It was so great. 
to see a show that we had built with so much passion be received with so much passion. I mean, we focus so much on attention to detail, but then to realize that the audience was as focused on detail as we were, was incredibly exciting that they were picking out all of the little Easter eggs that had been put into every scene and they were coming up with theories that they were engaging with the show, that it was a real dialogue. Um, and then also the incredibly creative TikTok videos and memes and things that were being created. Um, we loved passing them around the, the cast and the crew. Um, you know, it, it was uh, brought a lot of joy to us. Um, and and I'm, we were happy to see that it was bringing joy to audiences. Yeah. And you mentioned before, uh, you know, you were a sitcom actor yourself in the 80s, and then you're a director and have a massive amount of credits. And last year, you were Emmy nominated for the first time for directing for The Great. And after, you know, after having this nice long career, what does it feel like to finally be recognized at that ceremony? That was a great honor. You know, I was so proud of the work on The Great um, and um, wonderful to, to be nominated for it. Um, uh, it's great when your peers acknowledge the work that you're doing um, to be nominated alongside so many talented people um, is really a joy. So I'm thrilled when, when, when that kind of recognition comes. But ultimately, you know, the joy is in the making of it. And um, I had the best time making the great and the best time making WandaVision. And so that's reward in and of itself. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's wonderful work on WandaVision. Can't wait to see what, what you tackle next in your many genres that you, you are so capable of. So, <laughs> Me too. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, yeah. Everyone who's out there watching, make sure you subscribe to Gold Derby. And Matt, thank you once again for talking to me. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.